Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Are we ready for the word? If you're ready for the word, say yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, turn with me your Bibles to John 18. <clears throat> John 18 beginning in verse 28 to 38. John 18, 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If, we, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. That's very interesting. That the same of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying what death he would die. By what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking this, are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate then said, therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Look with me again in verse 37. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king? Then Jesus answered, you rightly said that I am a king. Now notice this, for this cause, say for this cause. He says, for this cause I was born and for this cause, say for this cause, I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. So you see that Jesus' uh, answer to Pilate, his response to Pilate, when he was being interrogated, this was one of the trials Jesus had before he went to the cross. He met before Herod. He also met before Pilate. Of course, the accusation against Jesus was that he was a king. And so Pilate was the, Roman gov was the governor of Rome, Romans, uh, Rome's representative in Judea, and of course, there cannot be two kings. So Pilate asked him this question. And Jesus answered. And Jesus' response to Pilate in verse 37, where he says, For this cause I was born, for this cause I came into the world, reveals to us that Jesus had a keen sense of his purpose and his destiny and even his identity. So I want to talk to us today, um, today and next week on what I've titled, Jesus Teaches on Purpose. Jesus teaches on purpose. Verse 37, reading it in the English Standard Version, says, Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You, said, you say that I am. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. So the word cause uh, in the New King James could also be rendered as purpose. You see, after your salvation, one of the most important things you need to know and walk in is a, the understanding and the revelation of your purpose. You have to. There are just some important things for a person. Have you ever wondered what you are doing here on this earth? Sometimes we get into the grind of daily routine, going to work, making money, taking care of the family. All those things are part of it. But you see, they lose their meaning if they are not expressions and part of our purpose. Why are you here on this earth? After you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, in fact, as a result of knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, 
The next one of the next things you need to find out is what would he have you do? When Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul asked him, you know, after, after, after you know, having met Jesus Christ, he said, what will you have me do? What is your purpose for my life? And you understand that the Jesus meeting Paul at that time was not just to save him, but also to commission him. And that is very, very important for us to see. You know, there are basic questions we ask, you know, where did I come from? Who has asked that question before? How many of your little children have asked you, mommy, how did I come here? Daddy, how did I come here? Those are basic questions. Where am I, where am I from? Where did I come from? Where am I going to? Or is there life after death? After we leave this world, this earth, where are we going to? Those are basic questions everybody must answer because it hinges on their eternal destiny. But sandwiched between where you came from and where you are going in between is what are you doing now or what are you supposed to be doing? What are you meant to be doing? That focuses on your purpose. And like I said, purpose is one of the most important things that you can discover. One of the greatest joys you can have in life is being right in the center of the purpose and the will of God for your life, accomplishing what he wants you to accomplish. So we're going to learn from no other person than Jesus because in Jesus' interrog interrogation or Jesus' conversation with uh, Pilate at his trial, this conversation is laden with truth concerning our purpose. Not everything, but I think it's a bit and quite exhaustive and there are truths, there are gems of truth that we can mine from this text. So the first point I want us to see Number one, number one, verse 37 again, Jesus says, for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world. So we see clearly that Jesus knew why he was here. He knew why he was born. The first point is this, your purpose predates your birth. Your purpose predates your birth. So he knew why he was born. He knew why he came into the world. Verse 37 again says, For this cause I have come. I have come into the world. We will agree that Jesus came into this world because he was sent by God. Would we be, would we be in agreement on that? Are you with me, church? Was Jesus sent to this earth by God or did he just show up by himself? No, he was sent by God. Look at what he said in John 10, 35 and 36. John 10. 35, if you call them gods, Jesus is speaking, to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, verse 36, do you say of him whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God. So we see that Jesus himself said that he was sent into the world. If he was sent into the world, it means somebody sent him. In the case of Jesus Christ, we know that not only did his purpose predate his birth, Jesus Christ had always existed before. This is the pre-incarnate God, but I'm speaking specifically now as a man. So Jesus was sent into this world. So if he was sent, it means the purpose for which he was sent, listen, had already been identified, had already been spelled out in the mind of God. And we have so many prophecies concerning Jesus Christ's purpose and what he would accomplish before, uh, even before he was born, before he came into the earth. So no one sends anyone on an errand without outlining to the person what they are going to do. We are preparing for our uh, conference in Benin, Fresh Dew Faith Peace, later on uh, uh, next month. And some of the assistant, new assistant pastors have been making trips. And one of the things they will tell you is that before they go, what they are meant to achieve is itemized, is outlined. It is because we are preparing and we find out that we need to do something. That is what informs their going on, embarking on a journey. And what they are to achieve, they are not just to go to the city and wander and roam around aimlessly. They already have what they are doing. Of course, because we are not omniscient and all-knowing, other things may come as they go and we say do this, do this also. But they have terms of reference. They have things they are going to do. When you send someone on an errand, you send him to accomplish something. What you expect him to accomplish to all intents and purposes has, has already been identified 
So when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he didn't roam about and God was scratching his head and say, I'll find a job for you. He knew what he was coming here to do. God knew why he sent him. By the same token, you yourself, your purpose has been preordained. It predates your birth. It predates your conception. God knew you in the distant and eternity past. And he had a purpose for you. And that's why you came into this earth. You must be able to say at some point, for this cause I was born. For this cause I have come into this world. Amen, church. So God knew you. Write this down. God knew you before your birth. God knew you before your birth. Let's focus on Jesus a bit here. The angel appeared to Mary. Like I said, Jesus' purpose was already there before he was uh, even conceived. And he was, uh, the angel told Mary who Jesus was going to be. All right, we already know that. Matthew, if you want to read some detail in that, Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 33. That's the account of the Annunciation when the angel appeared to Mary and told Mary who Jesus was going to be. This was who, this was before she even conceived Jesus. Before Jesus was conceived. It tells me that before you were conceived, God already knew about you. God didn't form your plan while you were in your mother's womb. God didn't form your plan after you drew your first breath. God didn't form your plan after you grew to five years old. No. He knew it in eternity past. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Jeremiah 1. This is a truth that cuts across the whole word of God. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Can somebody say before? Say one more time. What does before mean? It means before. <laughs> if you read the Bible, when, when God talks about those he, has called, he had called, you find different expressions. You find in Psalm 71, I believe, verse 5 and 6, it says, in my mother's womb. You knew me. David said, you knew me in my mother's womb. In Isaiah 49, which, which, is, which speaks about the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, actually, it says, you have called me from, from my mother's womb. It's a, another uh, verse says, you have caused me to hope from my birth. So if you read those verses alone, it may give you the impression that it was while you were in your mother's womb everything started. But Jeremiah takes us a step further. That yes, in your mother's womb you were known. Yes, after your birth you were known. But before all of that, God knew you. He says, before I formed, the word formed there, yatsa, which refers to the, the molding, the forming, the making of a person, all right, is the same word that is used. When he says God formed Adam's body from the dust and from the clay of the earth. So while he was in that period of gestation for nine months, before that even happened, before the sperm that from Jeremiah's father that, uh, that fertilized the egg in, in, in Jeremiah's mother's womb, before that action took place, God knew Jeremiah. God knew the exact sperm that was going to fertilize him, that brought him into being. In other words, take it further. Before Jeremiah's mother even knew Jeremiah, God knew, God knew Jeremiah. Before, if he says before, he doesn't tell us when before. That means as far back as you can take it, God already knew him. Before Jeremiah's father and mother came together, God already knew, knew it. If Jeremiah's mother was expecting a daughter, but a son came forth, God knew him. Am I talking now? Am I talking now? Because some people say, oh, I wanted a boy and a girl, but I had, I had two boys. Or I wanted a girl and a boy, I had two girls. And some lament about that. Well, if you are that boy or girl, that is none of your business. Leave your parents to worry about that. Amen, church. I said amen. Before all of those things happened, God knew that they would want a boy but a girl would come. 
Whichever, whichever way, whether faith or no faith, that is not your palaver. What is important is that you are here. And this is where the good sovereignty of God comes in. And it is this, that God knew the circumstances that would surround your birth. He may not have endorsed everything, but he knew you were coming. And he didn't say, hey, this is a mistake. So let's quickly look for a plan for Shola. No, he knew you were going to come. He knew the circumstances surrounding it. And in that foreknowledge and omniscience, he saw you, he knew you exhaustively, and he had a plan for you. So let's put it this way. Your, like I said, your purpose predates your birth. Your purpose is, exists. Let me write it. Let me read it as I wrote it so I don't botch it. It says, uh, uh, from when did God know you? Your purpose is as ageless as God. Your purpose is as ageless as God. Say, no, I don't agree with that. Okay. I ask you a question. Is God omniscient? No, answer my question. Is God omniscient? Does God know everything? When, does God, when did God know everything? If that is the right question to ask. For how long has God existed? Has anything taken God by surprise? You see, once you know that, even when you make your mistakes, God didn't endorse your mistakes but he knew you would make the mistake. And because he knew you would make it, guess what? He has a plan, not a backup plan to restore you. You will call it a backup plan. God has an original bespoke plan to restore you. That's the sovereignty of God that our natural finite minds cannot wrap, their, wrap themselves around. So here we see that Jeremiah's purpose was already established before his mother conceived him. Moses is another example. Moses, look at Je uh, Exodus 2, 1 to 3, and Hebrews eleven twenty three. Exodus 2, and a man of the house of Levi went out and took as daughter a daughter of Levi. We know this man to be Amram. We know this woman to be Jochebed. So then woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. We know this boy to be Moses. And in Hebrews 11.23, the writer of Hebrews says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden how many months? Three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. Now, I have some questions to ask you here. This was the time where there was the edict by uh, the pharaoh at this time that all little children should be executed, all boys, pardon me, as soon as they, they were born because the Jews, the Hebrews, <clears throat> had taken over the economy of, uh, which country now? Of Egypt. So the way, the, way, the way pharaoh was going to take care of this was Operation kill the babies, so snuff their lives out, kill the baby boys, snuff out their lives when they're born. But the scripture tells us that Moses' parents hid him for three months. Now, why did they hide him for three months? Hebrews 11 tells us by faith. Let me ask you, what is faith based upon? What is, how, how does faith, how do, faith is based on what? On the word of God. So it means they must have believed a word which superseded the king's edict. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us, but if you read the historian Josephus, Flavius Josephus, he actually tells us that when uh, Moses' his mother conceived Moses, her, his father Amram went to, was praying to God about it, went to consult the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen, that the boy that was going to be delivered was going to be Israel's deliverer from Egyptian bondage. These are in the writings of Josephus. And we have no reason to question it. And I believe it actually dovetails with the text because the Bible tells us by faith. Are you following me, church? By faith. So it means that Moses' arrival came at the right point in time. In fact, when you read in Acts chapter 7, it said that when the time of the fulfillment of God's word to Israel to deliver them from the bondage was ripe, Moses was born. In other words, God scheduled it. God had given 430 years or 400 years 
And when that time was going to come, God didn't just look around for anybody. He pre-selected, he chose, he chose the family into which that young man was going to be born and said, this is it, and Moses was born. So even Moses later on discovering that he was a deliverer of Israel was all as a result of the planning and the scheming that God had put in place. May I announce to you, church, that your own birth may not have been spectacular. There may have been no prophecies concerning your birth. But may I let you know that in the mind of God, there is a plan for your life. There was a plan conceived for you before the foundation of the world. That plan is as ageless as God. And that plan and that purpose is a good plan. It's a good plan. Say that God has a good plan, a good purpose for my life. The same thing with, um, with Paul. Galatians 1.15, write that down. But when he pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. So all these verses are showing that from your mother's womb, in your mother's womb, before even your mother's womb, God had separated you and called you to something. So write this down. Your birth was not an afterthought. Your birth was not an afterthought. I, was meet, I met with a man some years ago. I think I was doing an induction into a department. So I was talking, speaking with him. And so one of the questions we normally ask, at least I think in this team, how many children do you have? And he said, we have X, Y, Z. And when he said it, he started laughing. I said, why are you laughing? He said, we didn't plan for that. We just... <laughs> so let's say he wanted uh, five. Sorry, he wanted uh, five. So he has six. So he said, we plan for five. And he said, laughing. I'm asking, why are you laughing? You know, because in his own mind, that last one was a miss. Uh, we didn't plan this one. <laughs> they may have been surprised. Some, some, some of you mothers were surprised when you were pregnant. But God was not surprised. Amen. I said amen. Some of you may have even, they may even have said they didn't want you. But God wanted you. The fact that you survived shows that God has a calling upon your life. I'm going to share this. I had an experience years ago, a good number of years ago with a couple. They, they were having some issues and I was to see them with one of the assistant pastors and they came in to my office. And I don't, I've never done this before. And I, uh, I try as much as possible to keep to decency, decorum. There are ways people should be treated and talked to. As much as possible, I do that. So this was a woman. And if I don't have a relationship with you, there are certain questions I will not ask you. They were, I opened my door. They were walking. As they were walking to the desk, I just heard myself say to the lady, ask the lady, are you pregnant? And he, when I said that, I said, what kind, of, Shola, what kind of question is this? There are some questions that are a bit somewhat people may consider intrusive. You know, fine, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor, so that shouldn't be so much of a problem. But generally, I wouldn't do that. And for the next 20 minutes, she didn't answer. Simple question. At least, at least you'd have answered with a frown. Pastor, which kind of question you they ask? Ah, I beg you, man, mind your business. Mind your business. Because there are questions you ask ladies and the way they will look at you. The waiting concern you concern, what is your own? So, so I was surprised. For the next 15 to 20 minutes, she couldn't answer the question. The husband told her, he spoke in tongues, self. He said, tell pastor now, you are not pregnant. Eventually, she was pregnant. The husband did not know. The next day, she was billed for an abortion. This was Sunday, Monday. Eventually, she broke down in tears. So I didn't know it by looking at her. Because your husband, who should know more than everybody, didn't. And sometimes it doesn't show. She had kept it. That is what God does to preserve a destiny. You didn't hear me. That's what God, that child is born, that child has been dedicated, that child is alive and doing well. And they don't need to tell me that that child has a high calling and destiny on his or her life. Nobody needs to tell me that. Because God will go against the odds, will go against everything to preserve a life. There's some of you here that they wanted to abort you, but you are alive today. You are alive today. You are alive to do what? To accomplish the purpose of God. The devil tried to staunch you and stifle and kill your life, but he failed. That is a testimony to let you know that he will yet fail where your purpose and the calling of God on your life is concerned. Can you say amen? You say, what of those who, who died? I don't know everything, but even those people too, God had a purpose for their life. 
the, the sin of abortion, the sin of killing a life, is the killing a destiny. In the U.S. now, there, this, this uh, decision, Roe versus Wade, which uh, hinges on abortion, how many of you have heard that? You know, it, it, they're jitters now that that decision is going to be overturned. And people who, who want abortion, I say, the stupid thing they say is that a woman's right to her body. Are you so dumb? So you have a right to your body and because of that you can eject it or the fetus. Who are you? You must be thinking wrong. What of the rights of that child? The child doesn't have a right. Come on. Now I can understand, I can, we can discuss cases of rape, violence. I know there are some discussions that we can have. But the fact that at whim, a woman says she has a right to her body. Which dirty right? To get rid of a purpose and a destiny. What of if you were, you were that it, they removed? Am I in church today? I didn't get amen. Should I pick my own amen? Amen or me? That's rubbish. That's the spirit of this world. The fact that we are even having that discussion shows how, how, how far we have plummeted as a people. And that is the mindset of this world, a woman's right to her body. I've never, ever understood that discussion. So they ask, so we have to really determine when the child, when it becomes a child. Are you okay? Jeremiah said before, say before, say before. So that means God does not consider any child in the womb and it. God conce considers that child as a child. After all, aren't there children who are born five months? Doctors, five months, six months. I know they have to put them in the prof, che, in the incubator. I know it's, it's a very difficult situation to manage, but some of them survive. They are telling me, let me preach my word. I guess this is all part of the word. So number one, your purpose predates your birth. Number two, your purpose has to be discovered. It has to be discovered. Anybody following me this morning? Good. Your purpose has to be discovered. So purpose is not something that will just fall on you. When Jesus was speaking before Pilate, we see that Jesus understood his destiny. The question then is that when did Jesus know it? You see, you will not get to the end of your life, listen now, and say like, Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my race, I have kept the faith. If in the first place you didn't know the cause to which you are called. So you will not, listen, you will not fulfill your purpose in life by chance. You won't accidentally fulfill it, no way, no way. You must, first of all, know it. And Jesus knew his purpose. He knew the will of God for his life. How do we know that Jesus knew it? Let me ask you, when did Jesus know? How did Jesus know his purpose? How did he know? Who can tell me? Or why? How? You know, whatever question. Did Jesus know it because he was God in the flesh? Who wants to answer that? Was he... Jesus was God in the flesh, right? The word was made flesh. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh. So Jesus was the word. Jesus is the word. Jesus was the pre-incarnate word. He was God. So did Jesus come into this earth, and all of a sudden, he knew his purpose? Does anybody think that? Sorry? God told him. Okay, at what point did God tell him? At what point did he know? At one year, do you think Jesus knew his purpose? At three years, did Jesus know his purpose? At five, did he know his purpose? He knew, right? Share? Okay. Twelve. Okay, by twelve, we see that probably he had known or he was knowing. My point is this. Was there any... When did he know it? Uh, not, not by, let, 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 did he, this is the question. Did he know it automatically? 
He didn't know it automatically. Why didn't he know it automatically? He didn't know it automatically because he was a man. He was a man. Jesus, the same way you have come to know, if you know your purpose, the same processes involved in you arriving at the place where you understand your purpose is the same thing that happened to Jesus. In other words, when Jesus was born, he wasn't at the age of five. Uh, it wasn't at the probably age of three or four or five. Jesus just knew, yes, I'm the son of God. I'm the redeemer of mankind. No, there was a process. You know, sometimes children are, they are called precocious, which means they know beyond their age. Some of you have children like that. They are five years, but they already know things that are eight. They have, their intellect is highly developed. We don't know if that was the case of, with Jesus Christ. One thing is clear about Jesus Christ. His mind and his intellect, his learning processes was, uh, were not affected by sin. Sin has affected everybody in their body, in their soul, and in their spirit. But when Jesus was born, because he was born free from the taint of sin, sin had no effect on his body, on his soul, that's his intellect. So after Adam, the person with the finest intellect or mind or memory was Jesus. In theological parlance, this is called the noetic effects of sin. Noet, noetic from the word noose, which refers to mind. Jesus didn't have any of that. But he didn't know it by, by his intellect. He knew it through divine means. The same way you and I can know it today. You know the place the Bible says uh, uh, in Luke's gospel that Jesus went into the temple and he found in the scripture the place that it was written of him. Hebrews chapter 10 says that it is said in the volume of the book, it is written concerning me. Are you following me? Uh, I have come to do your will. Uh, he said, search the scriptures for in them you think you will have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. So it shows us that Jesus made an investment in the word of God. He had the spirit of God and somewhere along the line in the process, he found out that his identity was unique. And because his identity was unique, therefore his mission, his purpose, the purpose which he came to accomplish on this earth was equally unique. Can you say amen church? So we see here that Jesus knew his purpose but it was revealed to him. Write this down. The father helped him in discovering it. God the father, his father, helped him to discover it. And you know God wants you to discover his purpose. And you know God will try his best to get across to you. Do you know if you are in the wrong place, God will do everything to relocate you. Do you know that? Do you know that? He will give you dreams if he has to. He will give you a vision if that's what will get it done. He will speak through somebody if he needs to do that. He will bring a prophecy. He will do everything that he needs to do. Do you know why? Because your purpose, we call it your purpose, but actually it is the will of God for your life. So between you and God, who owns the will? Who is more interested in anything? You accomplishing it or God the architect of your destiny? It's God. That's why Jesus would say repeatedly, I did not come from heaven to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. So when you realize that you are here sent by God, you need to wait for directions and matching orders from the one who sent you for you to know what he wants you to do. Look with me at Luke chapter 2, verse 45 to 52. Luke 2, 45. This is when Jesus was about 12 years, like one of you mentioned. It says, so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So they saw, so when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, now look at this, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father, say father, uh -huh. and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about what? About who? My father's business. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth 
and was subject to them, for his mother kept all these things in her heart. Verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So verse 48 and 49 show us that Jesus was already coming to know his purpose. I want you to see two things there. His biological, could you have me put off this man? His biological father, or sorry, pardon me. His foster father, Joseph, right? And who? His heavenly father. Think about this. this. Here is Jesus. How old is Jesus now? He's 12. He's in the temple. Now, in Jewish custom, at what age does a child attain the age of majority? When is a child considered a man? 12. 12. It's at this age he assumes responsibilities of being a man. Follow me carefully here. And to clock this significant time, he goes to the temple at age 12. That's the first time he goes there. So here is Jesus, just to all intents and purposes, having become a man. He's now meant to follow his father back to Nazareth, where he was brought up. And he was meant to go back into whose carpenter shop? Joseph, because he's the first son. That's why later they would say, is this not Jesus the carpenter? He eventually did that. But instead of going this way, <laughs> what does Jesus do? He remains in the temple. Why? That is his father's house. He's 12. So his mother comes and here is Joseph. And as it is typically, the mom says, why have you done this to us? Your father and I, eh? we, 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 we've looked for you for three days. And Jesus, like a, we would say, what kind, of, what kind of audacity or temerity did he have? What gall or mitigated gall did he have to speak to his parents that way? And he said, don't you know I must be about my father's? Ah. Ah. Imagine what people have thought. Ah, we said it. We said it. Do you think Mary's, Jesus is, the pregnancy of Jesus by Mary, do you think it was without scandal? Of course it was. That's why Mary hid herself. Joseph wanted to take off. It could have been known. But Jesus said, don't you know I must be about my heavenly father's business? I want you to see that. Because many times in coming into an understanding of God's purpose, we need to resolve that tension between the will of man and the will of God. The will of man pulling you on one side, the will of God beckoning you. Jesus, however, had come to know that he was, that God was his father. Jesus was the only person at this time who could say that God was his father because he was born without sin. And as a result of that, his purpose was already identified because as the sinless, spotless lamb of God, he was the one who could take the sin of the world. He had started understanding his purpose. But listen, there's oftentimes that pull from our social background, from our family background. There are certain families where everybody's a lawyer. You are an engineer. You are an architect. You are a doctor. You can, God forbid that you be a teacher. Because they look down on those professions. There's that pulling. And some of us as parents need to allow our children discover their purpose and not saddle and foist the purpose on them. Did you hear me? Many of us parents want to study fine art. Fine art. I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. My child will not do that. God forbid. You want to play football? No, 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 no. That cannot happen to you. We don't do that in this family. Have you heard that before? In this family, this is what we do. In this family. Which family? Whose purpose are you to, to, to accomplish? I had a classmate. I've said this before. He was with me in Ife. We studied law together. And intelligent guy, but he used to play. He came out with a tutu. But of course, it's understandable because he didn't want to study law. He wanted to study engineering. I think marine engineering. Do they have marine engineering in UST? Yeah. He had filled this jam form, marine or something engineering. So his dad said, bring your form. As his father saw it, he just slapped him. He said, give me pencil and eraser. He erased the engineering and put law. 
He's the first son. He had three children. He has two sisters. He's the only son. His father has a law firm. He told him then, Koro, Koro, black and white. Who, who do you think is going to take over this? Have you read the name of, the, of, the, of my business, my place of practice? The boy studied engineering. Because he was intelligent, he made it to, made it to pass, did well, didn't have an extra. We were in Abuja together, finished laws. He told me, Shola, my mind is not in this thing. Oh. Say, As I finish this thing, I'm going into Europe. I like sports. I'm going to promote sports. I've not heard from him since after we were called to the bar, so I don't know where he is. But that's an example of, being, of somebody being forced to do something. Are you following me? For some other people, it's surroundings. Surroundings. My elder brother's best friend is a trained medical doctor, studied in UI. His father has been a professor for God knows how long. So he grew up in one of the best educational institutions, not only in Nigeria, but also in Africa. So he was surrounded by professor, 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 professor. In 400 level in UCH, he said, he told my brother, this is not what I'm meant to do. But it was past halfway. He finished, finished his uh, medical degree, did his housemanship, did his NYC. Immediately, immediately, say immediately. It's been over two decades now. He's not a doctor. He's an investment banker. He just came back from Harvard three years or four years ago for an MBA. He's an investment bank banker and he doesn't have a complex. He's not Dr. Shegun. He's Shegun. Because he discovered in medical school this was not what he was cut out for. Not many people have that honesty. You see, there is that tension between what men want you to do and what God wants you to do. But because Jesus Christ had come into relation, he had identified his uniqueness and his relationship with God, on the basis of that, he began to draw upon what God wanted him to do. That is why when you come into contact with Jesus and you become born again, God begins to reveal himself to you. In revealing himself to you, he reveals you to you. Did you get that? He begins to reveal himself to you. You can't know your purpose outside of God. And I'm not talking what people have marked for you. So it's good to go to all the schools. It's good to get, go to all the, have all the education. But it is better to keep God as your central focus. Serving him, seeking him, serving him, seeking him. In the process of serving him and seeking him, God begins to reveal who you are to you. You think you know yourself, you don't know. It's your creator who knows you. And he begins to reveal that to you. And you find that I studied law, but no, I'm meant to be a preacher of the gospel. Amen. Well, I studied engineering, but I, must be, I should be a businessman. I should make a lot of money for the kingdom of God. Am I saying all the knowledge you gain there will be wasted? No, not necessarily. God has a way of integrating and, you know, using that. But we need to understand this. Can you say amen, church? Can you say amen? So how do we know that Jesus uh, had, be, had started knowing what God wanted him to do? Look at verse 52 again. That Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. He increased. Now, if you read verse 52, it will give you the impression that after this occasion, Jesus started to increase. But that's not what it means. That word increased, that phrase increased in wisdom, the word increased there is in Greek construction, is the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense. And according to Mounts, the imperfect describes a continuous action normally occurring in past time. So it means that before Jesus, this happened, Jesus had already been increasing. So verse 52 is telling us that Jesus kept on increasing. It didn't mean that he started increasing. That process had been going on. So that increase, that change that was taking place in him, whereby he was increasing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, was what caused him to come to understand his purpose. That he was the son of God. And that he had a unique destiny. And that's why I said it is in the place of you seeking God and you f worshiping him, getting into his word, praying, having a spiritual ambience in your life, that things begin to open up and unfold in your life. Can you say a good amen today? Also observe that there were people who would have helped Jesus in coming to know his purpose. There were also people. Why do you think 
God, the angel, appeared to Mary and told, him about, told her about Jesus. You see, God could have stopped at that. But you realize that there are up to five other witnesses that spoke to Mary about Jesus. Number one. Who is number one? Number one. No, apart from Mary. Elizabeth. Because when Mary went to meet Elizabeth, notice Elizabeth's prophecy. She said, what is this? That the mother of my Lord should come to me. So that was a confirmation to Mary. Elizabeth didn't know, but by the Holy Spirit. In fact, the angel testified to Mary concerning Elizabeth. This is the sixth month with who, she who was called uh, 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 barren, not vice versa. When the shepherds also were on the field and the angel of the Lord appeared to them, the angel, the shepherd went into the house and they saw Mary and the mother as the angels had told them and they shared that experience with who again? Mary. At Jesus' dedication, Simeon pro uh, prophesied on Jesus and his parents and then he faced Mary and he said, this boy, this child is a sign it's for the rising and falling of many in Israel, a sign that shall be spoken against, a sword which shall pierce into your own hearts that the thoughts of many may be discovered to Mary. So that means Mary had plenty witnesses that this child she had wasn't an ordinary child. Who can agree with that? Now we don't know, scripture does not tell us that Mary shared anything with Jesus, but could it, have been, could it be possible? It may have been possible. She, knowing mothers, she, she, you say, this is my boy, come, let me tell you, this is how it happened, though. this is how it happened, this is how it happened, and all of that went to confirm everything that Jesus Christ was discovering about himself. Can you say amen, church? Okay, I have more to say under that, but let's go to point number three, so I can end this and pick it up next week. Number three. So what have we seen? Number one. Number one. What's number one? Your purpose does what? Predates your birth. Number two. Your purpose has to be discovered. Don't follow what people want for you. Develop intimacy with God and come to know what God wants for you. And then number three. Your purpose is in faces. Your purpose is in, what did I say? Faces. Look at our text. John 18, verse 33. John 18. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you speaking this for yourself or did others tell you concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Verse 37, Pilate answered and said, therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus said, you rightly say that I am. You see the repeated use of the word king here. King, king, kingdom. What is this telling us? Well, was Jesus a king when he came to this earth? You see, is, is it, who said no? So why do you call him king of kings and lord of lords? Is he, kings of, is he, kings? Is he king of kings? So answer me, is he king of kings? Is he lord of lords? But when he came to this earth, was he a king? You don't want to answer now. That brings me to my point. Your purpose is in faces. Jesus, you see, Pilate was surprised that Jesus, people called Jesus a king, and Jesus admitted that he was a king, but he, he, he was disturbed that how could a king be what? Be bound. If he's a king, then what, what is happening here? The truth is that there, were, there, were, there are two comings of Jesus Christ. The first coming of Jesus while he was on earth, he was not a king. The second coming, when he's coming to rule on this earth, for his feet will touch this earth, then he will be a king. He will rule as a king. So Jesus understood that his purpose 
had faces. In that first coming that he came to this earth, he did not come to be coronated or established as a king. Not a physical king. Not a king of the Jews. However, God was already preparing him for that. So that's why when Pilate answered him this question, asked him this question, he answered the way that he did. So write this down. There are faces in your purpose. There are faces in your purpose. Some of you know what God has called you to do. You are in one phase of your life right now. But you seem to know that there is more. You seem to know as much as you are assured that what you're doing now is the will of God. You've seen some other things. But you are in that struggle now. If God has shown me this thing, why has it not yet come? Why hasn't it happened? It's like 15 years, but I've been on this thing. But Lord, you told me this also. Understand that there are faces. If you don't understand that there are faces and there are stages, you may botch the process. You may step out prematurely. There was a time in John chapter 6 that the people, after Jesus had multiplied uh, 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 the loaves and the fish, and he had fed 5,000, the people wanted to take Jesus, the Bible says, by force and make him a king. Of course, somebody who can feed 5,000 people can feed 50,000 people. Before long, he'll be a threat to the government. And these were Jews under the rulership of Rome. They wanted somebody to deliver them. Even the disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom thought that Jesus Christ came for a physical kingdom. Because just before Jesus went to heaven, what did the disciples ask? He said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times and seasons, the Kronos and the Kairos. If you followed Pastor yesterday, you'd have heard that. That the Father has kept within his own power. In other words, this thing you're asking about, there is a time and there is a season when it's going to come to pass, but it's not yet now. Because the time it's going to happen, when Jesus will restore the kingdom to Israel, that, was, that is when he comes to be the king of the Jews and he reigns over the whole world for a thousand years. But that is in the future. If you don't understand this, people who sometimes can see some way your destiny is going, the purpose of God for your life is going, they would want to force you to do things prematurely and you may botch the process. Amen, church. So God has a great plan for your life. But your life is in faces. Write this down. Your faces, the faces of your life are connected. The faces of your life are connected. Luke 1, 30 to 33. And like I've said, wait for God's timing. When you wait for God's timing, what God has said will come to pass and you'll see them fulfilled in the right time, in the right season, and in the proper way. Lift your hands and thank God for his word. Thank him. Thank him that you have a purpose. Say it out loud. I have a purpose. Thank you, Father. Say it out loud. Thank you, Father, for calling me and placing a purpose on my life. Thank you, Father, because my purpose predates my birth and it's a good plan and purpose that you have for me. Thank you because I will come to discover, even in great, greater details, what you have purposed for me. In the name of Jesus. And I'll patiently wait for the right seasons and the right time for me to step into the faces that you have laid out for my life. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. No one looking around. Thank you, Father. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. No one is looking around. You're in church today, you're not born again. You don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's the first step you actually need to take in order to come to understand and know the purpose of God for your life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, someone looking around. If that is you, can I see your hand up? Can I see your hand up? Lift your hand up if you want to be born again. Can I see your hand up? Is there a hand there? If your hand is up, lift it up well. God bless you, whoever you are there. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, my brother. Anybody else? If you're watching online, you want to respond to this, put one hand on your chest. Leave the other one to heaven as a sign of surrender. If your hand is up, please keep it up. Thank you. Could you stand up very kindly? Just stand up. Thank you. Can you take your Bible, your bag, everything you came to church with and meet me right here in the front? Thank you, Jesus. If you want to join this young man coming to accept Jesus Christ, 
you can do so. God bless you as you come. Thank you, Jesus. Is he coming? God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my brother. Lift your two hands to heaven. You're surrendering to Jesus. Lift your hands up. God bless you, my brother. Here, please. Yeah, lift your two hands up. Say these words after me, meaning them. Say, Father God. Say it out loud. Father God, I come to you today. If you're watching online, say this prayer also with them. Put one hand on your chest. Lift the other to heaven. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for me and you raised him from the dead for my salvation. Jesus, save me now. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father, for saving me. I'm now born again. I'm your child in Jesus' name. I'll pray for you. Father, I pray for them as I lay my hands on them. I declare that they will not only prosper, they will also flourish. Thank you because now they are new creations in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And from this day forward, they will walk in the newness of life. They will not only prosper, they will equally flourish to your praise and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, my brothers. Congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. Follow this young man. The family of God would like to welcome you. Let's welcome them warmly.